Excellent. Yeah, Hermann, thanks a lot, and uh, really glad to have you all here. It is a pleasure. Actually, I was meant to give now an opening speech, greeting everybody and thanking all the funders by name, as well as the main speakers. I will not do that, of course. Just uh, I will try to provide some substance, uh, some food for thought, uh, because these are very exciting times in every respect when it comes to climate change, when it comes to climate policy, when it comes to human suffering, when it comes to solutions emerging. So it's a, a very interesting time. I'm glad you are here. Regarding the EasyMIP and, and this conference, yes, it's true. I pushed very hard, <laughs> my people, and they came forward and have now taken control of that and uh, do everything to manage a great conference. Uh, but I'm actually ultimately responsible for you being here, so if anything goes wrong, you know whom you can blame for that. Uh, it's me, yeah? so see you in the coffee break, maybe. <laughs> Anyway, so let me start. As I said, I would like to provide some substance and hopefully you can all see this on the screen, otherwise we have to dim the lights even further. But this is always the biggest challenge. Um, avoiding the unmanageable, managing the unavoidable. So this was a slogan I actually invented, I think, 15 years ago, and it was also the title of a United Nations Special Group, uh, a report on, on climate change. And this is in a way providing you with, in a nutshell clearly, with the dual challenge of climate change. Yeah? So on the one hand, we have to limit uh, global warming to something we can still manage. But even if we achieve uh, stopping, uh, conf confining, Global warming to two degrees, that is still a big, big challenge to manage the residual climate change yeah, because two degrees is a different world already. Yeah. So I'll revisit some of the concepts, but of course there are new aspects coming up all the time. So let me see if it works. No, it does not work. Ah, oh, didn't switch it on. Wonderful. So, since we are here in Potsdam, so a little bit of local color, actually, and uh, you know, the, the Physics Nobel Prize was given away and was awarded this year to people who worked on gravitational waves, actually ripples in space-time, and this was all devised predicted and so on by Albert Einstein and uh, based on also the Schwarzschild solution, you were able, one was able, because of the collision of two black holes, one was able to really detect those waves. Uh, and so that has, has been celebrated as a big, big uh, breakthrough of science and the Nobel Prize is given for that and so on. But uh, most of these things really started in Potsdam and the Potsdam Institute, as some of you may know, our main building on the Telegraph Hill is where Einstein's field equations were solved for the first time, and I'll come back to it a little bit later. This is the, the Telegraph Hill, and so we are not at that location right now, but you will have a chance to visit it, and many of you know it. So these are the field equations. They look very easy and very simple. Actually, the whole conference will be dedicated to these equations now, <laughs> somehow. <laughs> and here you have Schwarzschild. I have the pleasure to sit in his office, and he came up with this solution, which Einstein thought was a very simple solution, actually. Yeah? That's the black hole solution. Yeah? And Einstein presented it to the Kaiser Wilhelm Society. But what very few people know, Schwarzschild, who was a genuine genius, also laid some of the principles of climate science. So in particular, the radiative transfer equation, which we have in every climate model, actually. So there is a direct line from Einstein Schwarzschild to the Potsdam Institute, if you like, and to this conference. I come back to that a little bit later. So this is also an interesting year because it's 2017, and in 2007, precisely 10 years ago, this was, so to speak, the climate year in Germany. I served as the 
chief advisor to Chancellor Merkel on climate and energy related issues. So you see on the left hand side a meeting of the international um, academies. So some of you will see Ralph Cicerone in the picture, also from National Academy of Sciences, Leopoldina, Royal Society, John Horton, and so on. So it was a, I think, stunning meeting with Chancellor Merkel, and we handed over a declaration by the academies. And on the right-hand side, you see this was the G8. At that time, it was still G8. It has shrunk to G7. You see Putin in the picture, actually. It has shrunk to G7 and probably will di disappear entirely, I think, as will the G20. And they are sitting there uh, by the seaside uh, and having a good time and actually talking about climate action. No? As I was the chief advisor at that time, we had a historical meeting, I think, in the run-up to that conference in the Chancery in Berlin. So the Sherpas were meeting. No? The Sherpas are always preparing such a summit. And I was asked to give a presentation to tell people what climate change is all about. And this was actually my punchline. So, confining global warming. So, on the one hand side, you talk about clearly, let me see if it works. Yeah, somehow. On the left hand side, the vertical axis is uh, the climate anomaly. How much climate anomaly can we afford and how much climate anomaly can we avoid, actually? So on the one hand side, acceptability in terms of climate impacts, and the second, can we achieve it at all? Is it feasible to confine global warming to, say, less than three degrees? So this was my argumentation from the IPCC, the third assessment report. We had this famous burning embers diagram, IPCC reasons for concern. So in terms of acceptability, you can look in various categories, like tipping elements or valuable system, you see that it starts to get critical, so that means the red color is appearing around one, two degrees, and if you are going towards four degrees, it's all red, eh? you are in the high risk zone. Actually, recent updates of a diagram have shown that the red color is coming down all the way, really. Eh? So this is the acceptability thing, and on the upper hand side, achievability. And this was based also on economic analysis. And you see it's impossible to stop global warming at one degree, but maybe 1.5, actually at that time already, and definitely above three degrees. So you put these two things together, you exclude the upper part, because on the left hand side it's not acceptable beyond 2.5 degrees, but you also exclude the non-achievable thing that is below 1.5 degrees. Yeah? That leaves you with this corridor, 1.5 to 2.5 degrees. Yeah? And two degrees just sits at the center of this corridor. So it's two degrees. And 1.5 is the aspirational goal, clearly. Today we are here. And actually, this was 10 years ago. We are a little bit further already towards the abyss. But you see, this is the whole story, actually. Yeah? And it made a lot of impression on the Sherpas, except for the Indian one, who said, well, you know, when we look at villages in the Himalayas, they have moved up and down for hundreds of meters during the last two millennia. So there's no problem if we have 70 meter sea level rise. Yeah? This does not exactly apply to coastal zones, but anyway, this was the argument. Uh, we have come a long way since. Anyway, as you can see, this is the Paris Agreement. On the left-hand side, you have precisely well below two degrees. So this target, which somehow was introduced in 1994 by the German Advisory Council, for the first time really became a reality. So, managing the unavoidable. So let me start with the impacts. And of course, the science, the writing on the wall is becoming ever more compelling now. So this is Hurricane Maria, the devastation in Puerto Rico. And of course, you just had the wildfires in California where probably 20 people were dead and a lot of devastation. No? But it's really interesting, what will be the impact of Hurricane Maria? 
And so I just referred to two articles just appeared in the New York Times. So this is a picture from above by Xiang and other people. So demonstrating that actually the single hurricane event, which raged more or less only for eight hours, is destroying about 20% of the GDP. So it eats up 15 years of development in Puerto Rico. And the interesting implication now is, and hopefully this will be discussed also during this conference, is what will people do if their livelihood is damaged and threatened? Huh? They migrate. These are US citizens, of course. Huh? So there has been another interesting analysis that if now, say, a million Puerto Ricans would move to Florida, Puerto Ricans tend to vote Democratic. Cuban exiles tend to vote Republican. That is why the swing state Florida is mostly swung towards the Republican side. But what if you have an influx of one million Puerto Ricans? That will flip it back to Democratic. This will be the ultimate revenge of for the climate deniers. It's really interesting, yeah? and it may happen. So, if you believe some of studies that have recently uh, been published, and um, I'm sure you all, Nigel Arnell, for example, will have a say on that, but if you would have a static picture, so in the end, 1.4 billion people might be affected in the coastal zone. Of course, they will move outwards before that. But anyway, we will have to somehow relocate a huge part of the human population, one way or the other. Huh? The same applies to mountain regions, semi-arid regions, and so on. We tend to settle precisely where we shouldn't these days, and climate change will drive us back. We actually did a study for the Asian Development Bank, uh, a region at risk, where we looked at migration patterns. For example, this, these are, if you like, cartoons of migration patterns for Bangladesh, where there is just, as you know, an inflow of 650,000 Rohingyas into Bangladesh, a country which is awash with refugees, internal refugees already. Yeah? So if people complain about 10,000 refugees coming to, say, UK, Canada, Germany, even if it's a million, uh, this is ridiculous compared to what Jordan, Turkey, Bangladesh take on uh, and take in. And you see already, this is Narisoko and Fiji. Fiji is the co-chair of the COP23 in Bonn this year, and you see people are already underwater or the water rises to the hips. They will have to move, and where will they go? We will not buy a business class ticket and fly to Berlin or to New York. No, we will move to the next island, which is a little bit higher because we're relatives of our language is speak and the culture as well. It's island hopping, but not the luxury way. But it can also happen when this will <coughs> uh, sort of occur. This is a picture by the famous uh, Brazilian photographer Sebastião Zelgado. This was done after the genocide in Rwanda. This is somewhere in the Tanzanian steppe, in the savannah. And we recently did work and published it in PNAS. So Carl Friedrich Leusner was the leader of uh, how climate events, uh, extreme events, may actually lead to armed conflicts in a fairly sophisticated way, actually. Yeah? So first, you have an economic disruption by a flood or whatever. This will reduce GDP, so there will be hardship, reduction of livelihoods, and so on. What we found in a statistically significant way is that this will not affect countries and will not turn them into becoming violent if you have a more or less homogeneous cultural uh, setup there. But if the country is ethnically divided, fractionalized, there's a clear indication when this, the climate shock, will turn into violence. Huh? And this is a uh, very solid analysis, has been referred to many times now. So, what would be 
managing the unavoidable. Now, unavoidable means 1.5 or 2 degrees warming means many people will have to migrate on this planet in the next 80, 90 years. Uh, there's nothing that can avoid that in the end. So you have to manage global migration. And just a few ideas that have been discussed before and will have to come back. For example, we could say in a two degrees world, countries, nation will take in and accept immigration quota according to their historic national emissions. Eh? So, US would have to take up 20% at least of all the refugees. That would be a fair principle. Another thing that was discussed a long time ago is the so-called Nansen passport. Uh, very few people know about it. It was uh, created uh, by Fridtjof Nansen, or he suggested that after the First World War, and 50 countries accepted it. So the people who had been expelled, say, from Russia and so on, and, had, and were uh, having a, a, a Nansen passport, were allowed to enter 50 countries and were even allowed to work there. So this is unthinkable today, really. Yeah? But this happened 100 years ago. And why not having a global green card where all the climate refugees have access to labor markets? Yeah? And so my, my talk is really, in a way, honoring this person here, uh, who is one of the titans of science, as well as humanity, clearly, and too few people know about him. Fridtjof Nansen, who looks quite, um, you know, compelling at this picture, let's put it there. He's becoming a little bit milder if you have pictures of him in the later stage, but of course, Antipoietius knows very well about Friedrich of Nansen. I mean, he was a zoologist, so he started in biological sciences. He became then the godfather of polar research. Chris Repley knows about that. Uh, so he had two extremely successful expeditions. And then he turned into a great humanist, actually, and came up with this idea of the Nansen passport. So maybe in the times of climate change, we will have to revitalize, to revive the Nansen passport uh, for all countries of the world. And he received the Peace Nobel Prize also. Avoiding the unmanageable. So I will not talk so much about that, because this is my general theme and my main focus. And we just published last year if you like, the ultimate uh, map of uh, what it means to change the climate and to push up the climate the anomaly. So you see this uh, curve at the bottom is just global mean temperature since uh, over the last 20,000 years. And you know, during the last ice age, uh, maximum Climate anomaly was about minus three degrees only. So that's not a lot, actually. Yeah? And when we emerged from the Ice Age, the Holocene 11,000 years ago, agriculture was invented and so on, the extreme stability of the Holocene. And on the right-hand side, you see now what the scenarios are. So there's one very optimistic scenario, the green one. And when, unfortunately, we are on the most pessimistic scenario right now, which would propel us out from the Ice Age into the hothouse, so to speak, with eight degrees warming by 2,500. But even if it would be an intermediate um, scenario, you see we would breach clearly the corridor of Paris, which is the gray barrier. And um, what you see there are the tipping elements, actually, with all the error bars, clearly. Yeah? and science will narrow them down over the next 10 years or so on. But you see, in order to avoid the unmanageable, we clearly have to keep to Paris. But even if we stop global warming at two degrees, it will be a different world already. We may, we may lose Greenland ice sheet, actually. Yeah? We will definitely lose most of the coral reefs. And there's a roadmap for achieving that, uh, which we published together with Johan Rockström and a few others. I, Question is, will it happen at all? So here comes my 3D theory in the last two minutes or so on. It will be a combination. The world will only react if there is this combination of disaster, discovery, and dignity. Disaster is obvious. 
Disruptive innovations discovery. Very few people know that uh, PV capacities have grown over the last 10 years at the rate of 35 degrees per annum. Now, this is an explosion. Huh? This is completely outshining the industrial revolution. And finally, dignity, it's all a moral issue, of course. Huh? Shall we allow the Pacific world to be drowned by global warming, or shall we try to disinvest, divest from fossil fuels, as the Catholic Church is doing right now? Okay, that brings me back, uh, in a way, juxtaposing uh, two thoughts of the world. Uh, one is here, just the front page, a uh, uh, screenshot of the New York Times. Yesterday, I see on the one hand, wildfires sweep across Northern California and so on. And at the same time, EPA tries to dump uh, uh, the clean power plan of, uh, of, of Obama and so on. It, the in, the, sort of the contrast couldn't be starker, actually. While we see all these things raging, uh, we say, oh, forget about the problem. Huh? And that brings me to Albert Einstein again, my favorite quote from him. Huh? The world will not be destroyed by Trump and Pruitt and Putin and so on. It will be destroyed by all of us who watch without doing anything. So let's do something. Thanks a lot. When it comes to climate change, when it comes to climate policy, when it comes to human suffering, when it comes to solutions emerging, so it's a, a very interesting time. I'm glad you are here. Regarding the EasyMIP and, and this conference, yes, it's true. I pushed very hard <laughs> my people, and they came forward and have now taken control of that and uh, do everything to manage a great conference. Uh, but I'm actually ultimately responsible for you being here, so if anything goes wrong, you know. Yeah. Oh, excellent. Yeah, Hermann, thanks a lot, and uh, really glad to have you all here. It is a pleasure. Actually, I was meant to give now an opening speech, greeting everybody and thanking all the funders by name, as well as the main speakers. I will not do that, of course. Just uh, I will try to provide some substance, uh, some food for thought, uh, because these are very exciting times in every respect. A special group, uh, a report on, on climate change. And this is, in a way, providing you with, in a nutshell, clearly, with the dual challenge of climate change. Uh, so on the one hand, we have to limit uh, global warming to something we can still manage. But even if we achieve uh, stopping, uh, conf confining global warming to two degrees, that is still a big, big challenge to manage the residual climate change, yeah, because two degrees is a different world already. Yeah? So I'll revisit some of the concepts, but of course there are new aspects coming up all the time. So, let me see if it works. No, it does not work. Ah, oh, didn't switch it on. Wonderful. So, since we are here in Potsdam, so a little bit of local color, actually. And, uh, you know, the, the Physics Nobel Prize was given a whom you can blame for that. Uh, it's me, yeah? So, see you in the coffee break. Maybe. <laughs> anyway, so let me start. As I said, I would like to provide some substance, and hopefully you can all see this on the screen. Otherwise, we have to dim the lights even further. But this is always the biggest challenge. Um, avoiding the unmanageable, managing the unavoidable. So this was a slogan I actually invented, I think, 15 years ago, and it was also the title of a United